um, CDM uh, research colloquium for uh, the spring 2021 quarter. Um, today we have Dr. Uh, Brianna Persadas is a CRA Computing Innovation Fellow in the Department of Agricultural Leadership and Community Education at Virginia Tech. Her research is focused on the intersection of agriculture, technology, and user-centered design. Uh, when she completed her PhD at the University of Florida, she was the first Latina to earn a doctorate from the Department of Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Congratulations on that. Uh, Dr. Posadas yeah. has also received her Master of Science in Agricultural and Biological Engineering at UF and her Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Harvey Mudd College. Uh, she currently works with the Agra Ability and Harvest programs at Virginia Tech, continuing her work in user-centered design and agriculture. In addition to addressing usability and accessibility of precision agriculture technologies, she is studying how to best utilize big data in agriculture while also protecting the privacy and security rights of growers. Her previous work in agriculture includes using hyperspectral imaging techniques to detect AM and Fuji apples in Korea and creating a crowdsourcing platform to collect ground truth data on lambs quarters in Washington, DC. Dr. Posadas has also worked in technology policy studying predictive policing, pre-child risk assessments and how social media affects communities of color. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today and I will turn it over to you for your lecture. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I see there's about 15 people here, so a little bit of a smaller group. So if you have any questions and you want to interrupt, then that's fine. I do not see the chat, so you can just unmute yourself and ask a question if you need to. Uh, and before I begin, I wanted to share a fun fact. I don't know if you all knew. Uh, last week, Dr. Julian Brinkley, he is a former lab mate of mine. So he and I finished our, we did our PhDs um, with the same advisor in the same lab. And I was super excited that we both were invited to come and speak to you all. So hopefully his was a great lecture. I think his research is really interesting. And I hope you all learned a lot from him. And I hope you all can learn a lot from me as well. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk, whoop, hit the desk. All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, my work in human computer interaction and how I'm applying it to the field of agriculture. Cool, so I always like to start with the 2050 problem. In um, agricultural industry, this is something that a lot of people think about. And um, this is why we are um, working on a lot of these different technologies is because the prediction is that by 2050, if the food production continues at the rate it is now, that we're not gonna be able to produce enough food to feed the population as it's predicted to be um, in 2050. So what we need to do is increase our food, food output by 70%. And in addition to increasing the amount of food, we also need to um, develop more efficiency improving technology to also reduce the environmental impact. Um, agriculture, traditional, traditional agriculture has a lot of um, environmental impact. Uh, so in this slide, there's a few different ways that people are approaching this problem. Uh, from GMOs, I think people are pretty familiar with that um, technology in general, or that debate in general. Um, there's indoor farming, the vertical farms, um, the vertical farms have really taken off in, um, in Asia, in Japan, in Korea. There's been a lot of interest, a lot of industry booming there of taking advantage of um, the vertical space, basically, and building um, indoor farming in these um, taller buildings there's been interest in doing some more urban farming, trying to take back some of the land um, within cities. Um, even the small little spaces, you can grow food, you can grow enough food to support the community. So there's a lot of interest in that as well. And there's a lot of interest in um, introducing more technology into the actual large agricultural fields that I think people think of mostly when they think about agriculture. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that that is my, um, that's where I started with the whole, um, my study of agriculture was with precision ag. Uh, so precision ag is this, it can be summarized in this cycle here. Um, and it's basically just applying the right treatment at the right place at the right time. 
And so the way that we are able to do that is we evaluate the needs of the field and we adopt the application of the inputs to those needs. So in this example, this is from my master's thesis with the hyperspectral imagery. So we first, wait, hold on, I think I can do a I can do this laser pointer, right? Are you guys seeing that? Cool. So um, first we start with the data collection. Here we have a researcher who is using the hyperspectral camera and we're trying to look for, um, we are looking for early symptomatic, late symptomatic and nutri nutrient deficient leaves for Marasana blotch disease. Um, the nutri nutrient deficient leaves were for um, uh, against false positives. And then we, we had that as an example when we were building the classifier. So after we had this data, we were able to analyze it. We were looking at the different spectra, the different reflectance off the leaves and trying to figure out which wavelengths would give us the information that we needed to detect the disease. And once we were able to do that, we were able to generate a prescription map for the farmer. So then we were able to take that information map it out for them and give it back to them so that they could apply the fungicide specifically where um, there, there actually was the disease. So that way, you know, they're reducing their environmental impact, they're reducing um, money, reducing time, um, and also um, the safety of the workers. So this is the researchers who are um, applying the fungicide and you can see that they're, you know, completely protected from head to toe. I mean, it's poison, they're, they're spraying poison into the field they need to be protected. And so as much as we can reduce that, you know, the, not only the better for the plants and um, the environmental impact, but the worker safety as well. So even though precision ag can have a lot of benefits, um, I guess it, you can save a lot of money. I think the study was a farmer in the US can save about $1,500 a year if they're able to adopt some of these technologies. There are um, some barriers, especially to small and mid-sized farmers. So one is the lack of products that bring together engineering and ergonomics. So a lot of times the technologies that are being built are being built without the farmer's input. Um, this is pretty um, traditional engineering design thinking is you know, somebody comes to you with a problem and then you just build a prototype and then bring it back to them near the end of the product cycle instead of trying to solicit their feedback throughout, throughout the whole process. So we end up deploying technologies, deploying products that the farmers just either can't use because it doesn't actually address their needs. Um, it's too complicated. So they, they don't want to bother. They're just like, you know, I've been doing it this way, you know, all my life. It's been working so far, so I'm not going to change. Um, and a lot of times with these bigger, more complicated machinery that we're putting out there, we're also not putting out the infrastructure to support them. Uh, so a um, pretty big example is John Deere. I feel like some people are familiar with that. That's the, the technology and the sensors on the tractor nowadays. Uh, once you deploy that into the field and it breaks, the farmers don't really have the um, engineering expertise to fix that. And if, they, if there isn't a John Deere store nearby, like what do you do? Your tractor is broken, you don't know how to fix it and you can't use it. So we don't put that support out there as well. Then we're not really solving the problem. We're just creating more problems out there. So what I strive to do in my research is to use user-centered design to alleviate these agricultural issues, uh, to bring the communities more together and to produce more effective solutions that are actually gonna work for the farmers. And so I know you all, uh, some, some people here are working in design uh, I'm not sure how many people are also looking at user-centered design or human-computer interaction. And I don't know if Julian went over it last time, but I'll just briefly go over that as well. Um, so the idea of um, human-computer interaction is that we are evolving the users throughout the whole design process. So like I said before, in traditional engineering, you just kind of bring, the, bring them the prototype at the end. Um, instead, we bring in the users all the way from the beginning from the brainstorming sessions. Um, we bring them the brainstorming session, we do rapid prototyping, paper prototyping, we bring them in, have them again test it out, give us their feedback. Um, and as we progress to more um, sturdy prototypes, we're just constantly getting that feedback. They are constantly in the loop and they are um, making sure that we're on the right track so that at the end when we deploy the product, it is something that they can actually use. Um, it integrates different kinds of disciplines and expertise. 
Uh, a lot of my work is interdisciplinary. I am in the agricultural leadership and community education department, but then I also have projects where I'm working with people from sociology and the College of Engineering and computer science. And we really need all of those different expertise in order to address these questions. Uh, managing an inner design process, uh, I talked a little bit about that already. Uh, it's the idea that like, you're never really done with the product, even after it's deployed you're still in that process. You should be checking up on it and checking back in with the community to making sure that what you built is um, still addressing the problem or it created another problem and you had to go back and try to address that as well. Um, and then conducting effective usability evaluations. So there's um, the system usability scale that we use. It's the like industry standard for addressing usability. Oops which we define as the extent to which a product can be used by specified users to achieve specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a specified context of use. A lot of alliteration there. Uh, so the idea that um, if ultimately the end user can't use it, then it's not usable and it wasn't a good design. And most of the time, the engineers, the designers, we're not the end user. So just because we can figure out how to use it doesn't mean that the end, the actual end user can't. So we got to constantly be keeping that in the forefront of our minds. So this is the user-centered design process in a nutshell. Um, kind of just summarizes what I already talked about before. Um, bringing in the users in the beginning to brainstorm, you know, what it is that we actually, what are the requirements that the product needs to have? The conceptual design, where we do the paper prototyping, uh, so we can quickly make changes as we're showing them the different interfaces and design implementation and you can you recycle here with the usability evaluation if you create um, a prototype and it's not very usable then you go back make changes until you can get something that's going to meet the requirements and then you launch it into the field and maintain the product so the the three different projects that i wanted to go over to kind of illustrate these different um, the different ways that we're using HCI in ag. Uh, the first is the crowdsourcing ground truth data collection for precision ag using a citizen science mobile application. Uh, the, sec the, the next two are ongoing projects right now, uh, the affordable flexible robotics to aid farmers with mobility limitations, and then also assuring the future of farm data through socially responsible innovation and cyber biosecurity. So the first project is, um, is my dissertation actually. So going back to the precision ag cycle, what I wanted to focus on was the data collection part. And the data collection part is actually divided into two parts, the remote sensing and the ground truthing. And so when you are um, creating the classifiers, you're using remote sense data mostly to do that. Um, and you can create a classifier um, to detect um, different things in the field um, without having like the actual ground truth data. So um, I use the, an oak tree example. So say you wanted to figure out where all the oak trees are in the United States. So there's all these satellite imagery of the US that so we're constantly imaging the earth. So you can take those image, images, you can create a classifier and you can train it to find where the oak trees are. But in order to actually verify it, to make sure that you are actually detecting what it is you think you're detecting, you literally need somebody on the ground running around confirming like, yes, that pixel does have an oak tree there. So that's correct. So that part is very labor intensive. It's very time consuming. And a lot of times it's a poor grad student who has to go around running around the ag field, um, putting out tarps or, you know, making those um, um, collecting that information so that we can verify the algorithm. It is a lot, it is very easy now and cheaper to do the remote sensing to get that satellite imagery. And it's the ground truth thing that's just really difficult. But you, we really need that if we wanna make sure that the algorithms that we're creating and using in the agriculture industry, that they're accurate. So what I wanted to do is to see if I could crowdsource that. And in crowdsourcing it, also getting the community more involved with this whole process so that the algorithms would be a little less of a black box because they had a hand in actually um, creating it. So my goal was to uh, design and evaluate a usable technology to address the labor shortage and ground truthing through the crowdsourcing application. 
And so uh, for various reasons, I ended up reaching out to the University of DC. They are the land grant for the District of Columbia, and they are the only urban land grant, I believe. So they do a lot of, fo a lot of focus on agriculture in the urban context and within the city. And they had an interest, the researchers there had an interest in learning more about lambs quarters. So lamb's quarters is an edible plant that's mostly found in Indian cuisine. It is classified as a weed. It is resilient and can grow in difficult places, construction sites, roadsides, um, vacant lots. When, during the study, when I would show um, users the images of lamb's quarters, they would recognize it uh, as like, oh yeah, that grows in my garden. I just pull it out because I don't want it. Um, so it is something that was very common and very familiar but they just didn't realize that it was something that they, they could actually eat and be a part of their diet. It is high in calcium, protein, vitamin A, and C. And as part of the extension outreach of the University of DC, they did want to encourage people to, um, to grow lamb's quarters and to eat it. And they were, there was interest in doing like um, cooking lessons and things like that at their farmer's market to further um, promote the consumption of this plant. Oops, I don't know why that keeps happening. So we were, um, the researchers wanted help to mapping where it was currently being grown in the in, in DC. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say there. These were other images of lamb's quarters that was found, found throughout DC. Um, as you see growing out of the fence, uh, growing in the, in the crack in the sidewalk, um, growing on the side of a building, growing out of like a pipe, so people um, throughout the study, you know, they were finding it growing in these really, um, I guess, difficult places and really um, supported the, the idea that the lamb's quarters is a really resilient plant. So following the user-centered design process um, and soliciting feedback through the design iterations, I started with the pilot study with an agroecology class at the University of DC's Firebird Farm. So these are some students who are testing out the app. Um, after I got some of their feedback, then I went through the University of DC volunteer listserv. They have an extensive, extensive um, listserv of volunteers, a lot of like master gardeners, people who were learning um, more about how to be more efficient gardeners. So they were the ones who tested, who helped me to test out the app. Um, they could, I wanted to say here. Um, yeah, so a lot of times they, they would just took the app and they went on their own time, you know, when they went and they walked the dog, um, walking to or from work. This was before the pandemic, so people were out and about. Um, and even, you know, out with the National Monument. I thought that was kind of fun that we were able to find lands quarters around this area as well. So this is a video of the app. See if I can get it going. Yeah, there we go. So um, this is you know the first screen where they had to make an account, just the username and a password. I didn't want to collect any personal information, especially because we were mapping and collecting GPS coordinates. So I didn't want this to be tied to them. Um, this is the, the first screen where they were able to get more information about Lamb's Quarters. They were given some training materials beforehand, but that was just like a, a refresher if they needed it. Um, and then they could start their data submission. Oh, sorry, this is going through the site first. Um, so this is the site where they could um, refresh about what, it, what characteristics made up Lamb's Quarters so they can identify it when they were out. All right, and then I think it's going to go to the data submission, where we, again we had reminders, we had um, images from other users that had been um, correctly classified, so they had examples from the area. Um, they were able to upload their GPS coordinates. They were able to upload the image. They can either take the image um, from within the app, or they can do it. They can upload it from their um, from their photos. These are, this is from my phone, so a lot of silly photos there. And then it auto-populated the time, the date, 
And then we had these follow-up questions because some of them were master gardeners and they uh, knew a little bit more. They were able to fill out some of these descriptions. Um, these, this more detailed qualitative data was just kind of supplementary because we were more interested in figuring out where exactly the plant was. And if the researchers needed more information after having knowing where it was, they could go in and investigate for themselves if they thought that um, there's something interesting to look into. Oh, and they were able also to see the map of where other users had already um, had a positive classification of lambs quarters. So for testing, people were trying to kind of spread out. Uh, but in, in general, during while they're using the app, they could try to go and see where there were hot spots to see if there were more plants to be found in that area. Oh, and that's just the um, usability, evaluating the usability of the app. All right, we move on. Uh, so in the results, um, using the system usability scale to determine whether or not it was usable for, for them. Uh, we got a score of 80.13, which indicates a usable um, system. Out of the 25 images that were um, submitted, 18 of the images of lambs quarters were classified correctly. So this gave us a 72% classification rate, which was actually it's um, in range with other studies who have had um, had non-lay people go out and make classifications of plants. So, and we saw that there was a moderate agreement between the non-expert and expert classification. We had all the classifications verified by the researchers at the University of DC. So we were able to create that um, usable system for the University of DC. And so that addressed the data collection part of precision ag. So this next, this next project, um, focuses on the actual technology side of what is it, what um, the current technologies and tools that the farmers are using and how can we make them more usable for people with different abilities. So this is the affordable, flexible robotics to aid farmers with mobility limitations. This is a project that is being sponsored through AgriAbility, um, which is, um, a program where we help to address farmers who have different illnesses or injuries or disabilities, but want to continue to work on their farms. Uh, we work specifically with like small and mid-sized farms, rural and urban settings. Uh, we have a lot of people in the program who are beginning farmers or veterans. And we also try to support um, socially disadvantaged farmers as well and making sure that they are able to continue the livelihood that they've chosen. So some of the different ways that we've like adopted the technologies, uh, sometimes it's as simple as um, reshaping the handle of the shovel. Instead of having the long handle, having it, um, having it curved, having it curved up so that you're holding it, um, I guess more like a crank than you are straight. So then there's like this less bending that you're doing. If you're, you know, you're out there using the shovel for an extended period of time, that little adjustment can make a really big difference. Uh, we also do a little bit more technical changes um, for farmers who are wheelchair bound, but still want to, you know, go out and use their tractors. They want to go out into the field with in their wheelchairs. There are adaptions that we can make so that they are able to continue um, to do the kind of work that they want to do. So this is a, conceptual, a conceptual idea of the, um, the robotic, the exoskeleton that we're creating. Um, this project, we are working with AgriAbility, Torque and Total Motion Physical Therapy to create this robotic system. We have, I'm gonna go to the next one because it has the larger image. So we're focusing on three different um, areas of the body, the robotic blood, to help with grasping, the flexible back support to help um, kind of like offload, um, to make it a little bit easier to bend over and so that they're not carrying so much of that weight on their spine. And then the knee as well to help with motion assistant and to prevent injury. These were the three different parts that a lot of the farmers were telling us were um, areas of concern, areas where they ended up having a lot of pain and issues later in life. And the exoskeleton that we are building is based off of this other one that the 
that Virginia Tech has already created for workers um, in a warehouse at Lowe's. And I think I can play this. maybe not you should you should be able to um the sound you might have to change the sound settings of where the sound is playing from there you go all right so let me i think i have to share a different screen stay strong and stay healthy. So we built an exosuit right, with that? Virginia Tech to give our store associates superpowers. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? When they go to lift those yeah. things yeah. over and over again, it just creates strain on their bodies. It makes them tired. The suit's gonna make them get through their day in an easier manner. One of our major goals for this was to make it easier to lift heavy objects. We wanna avoid injuries and give people more energy while lifting. The exosuit is the end result or manifestation of a very long and rigorous research project to really make sure that this was going to be the thing that would work. We've made it as simple as possible. We use textiles as a human interface to make the suit comfortable and conformable, as well as being flexible. We use carbon fiber in the back and the legs so that it can twist and bend with the person. As the person bends, the carbon fiber will store energy, sort of like a bow and arrow, and then when the person stands back up, it returns the energy to them, just like releasing the arrow. The team includes four undergraduates and four graduate students. They've really taken care of calculations, need finding, prototyping, to making a refined design, which we can put in the store. Our associates are excited about seeing something different. Their reaction is, wow, it's really nice to see the company doing something to help us in a radically different way. And just how cool is that? It's been wonderful working with Lowe's Innovation Labs because they're trying to dream of what the future could hold. And at Virginia Tech, we're trying to invent the future. This exosuit is literally the first step. Exosuits of the future will have better form factors, more amazing powers to make this superpower even better. So those exoskeletons are already um, deployed at Lowe's. It's the Lowe's here at, in Christiansburg, actually. Um, some of the farmers that we spoke to had talked about specifically coming to the Lowe's here just to see the exoskeleton in action. All right, let me move this back. So that is the basis of the exoskeleton that we're trying to adopt for the far, for farm use. But there are a lot of differences between using the exoskeleton in a controlled indoor environment versus out in the field. And so that's what this project is looking at. Um, we're still finishing up year one here where we're conducting the surveys and interviews of service providers and farmers from AgriAbility to assess um, you know, what kind of changes would be need to made, be made with the exoskeleton in order for them to be willing to use it and for it to actually be helpful for them. Once we finish wrapping that up and hopefully things open up a little bit more with the pandemic, I will actually be able to have the farmers come in and start testing out the exoskeleton in the control setting. And then after we get that feedback, we'll be able to go and take it out into the field for them to test it um, in, their own, in their own homes. So the project, they were able to go and speak to service providers at the National AgroAbility meeting in 2018. The major feedback they received from the providers was that, um, for small to mid-sized farms, farmers are the ones who are making the purchasing decisions. So they're the ones we need to convince um, about you know, all the benefits of using it and keeping the cost low. Unlike with the Lowe's project where you know, it's upper management who's making these decisions. And um, so, those, so it's a different um, clientele. You're instead of trying to convince management, you're trying to convince the actual worker uh, we are also writing right now, we're writing up our results from the surveys of actual farmers uh, throughout the state of Virginia. I'm not quite sure how much I can talk about that since it um, hasn't been submitted yet. Um, but one thing I think I can share, my favorite part of the results from that, from those surveys, uh, we, were also, we were asking them about um, how other people's opinions of them wearing the exoskeleton would um, influence their willingness to wear it. And every farmer was just like, 
yeah, we don't care. We don't care about their opinion. We, we're out in the field, you know, nobody's out there. It's just us. Uh, a lot of these um, were, you know, small family farms. And it was like, if it works, it works and we're going to wear it. It doesn't matter what people think. I can look like an idiot and I'm going to do it because that's what we do. We're weird. And I really, I really appreciated that. Cool. So I'm uh, going to go through the last project I kind of wanted to highlight. This is also ongoing. Is assuring the future of farm data through socially responsible innovation in cyber biosecurity. So going back to the data collection of precision ag, there is um, just in general, you know, we are we have a lot of data on ourselves that is being collected by various entities, um, government, uh, companies, each other. There's a lot of our data is out there, um, and some of the data um, ha has been regulated and is protected. Um, HIPAA, GLBA, and in Europe, the GDPR. So we know that certain aspects of our identity are somewhat protected and regulated by the government. Um, but there's so many holes. There's so many ways that we are still exposed on social media being a big example. So definitely, you know, be careful what you share on social media. Um, and the other, the other type of data that's not protected is our cultural data. And people may not think of ag data as personal data or something that would be in need of protection. But there's just so much information that is being generated now on these farms, especially as we improve the technology and we start moving into smart farms. Uh, by 2025, it's predicted that an average size farm will produce more than a million ag data points a day. And that includes everything from the livestock to weather data, farm management data, the plant data, machinery. And there's a lot of information that is being sent out there. And being collected um, primarily by agricultural technology providers, ATPs like Monsanto and John Deere. And so the, this data is not considered personal data. However, it is tied to GPS. Um, as I was talking about before with the prescription mapping, a lot of the, the uses of this data is not, you can't do anything with it without those GPS coordinates. In GPS coordinates, it is very easy, you know, to cross-reference that and trace it back to the farm. There's not really a way um, to anonymize that. I mean, you can take off their names, you can take off the name of the farm, but if the GPS is still on there, I would consider that personal information. But right now, there's no, there are no regulations um, covering uh, or covering GPS data. And it's, it's a huge concern for people in the field 77% of American farmers are concerned about who has access to their data and how it will be used. As I mentioned before, a lot of this data is being collected by the agricultural technology providers. A lot of times the data is taken without their permission or without their knowledge. Um, a famous case, once again, is John Deere with the turn the key policy. So uh, according to John Deere's um, user agreement, just by turning the key on their tractor, you're agreeing to their policies. So you don't even get the benefit, you know, of the, the large document with the small print that you scroll and you pretend to read. John Deere doesn't even give them that. Just, just turn the key, you turn it on, and you agree to let them take your information. So there are these unclear boundaries between data ownership and data control. Um, farmers get locked into these user agreements. Um, already, farmers have suffered legal consequences for not following the terms that they never read. Um, you know, farmers have gotten in trouble for trying to fix their tractors, um, that they used to be able to do that. Um, but then that violates the agreements that they didn't know that they signed. Um, farmers don't really have a choice as um, ATPs become more dominant in the field. We're seeing a lot of sort of monopolies happening where the all the technologies that are being used for the farm are being controlled by just a handful of companies. And so it's not like you can really take your business elsewhere. They're becoming fewer and fewer choices. So you kind of have to buy into the system if you want to continue to, to be able to operate your farm. So this is an ongoing research project that I'm doing with, um, with another a coworker in sociology. So what are the different ways that we can actually address these problems and try to give more rights and support to the farmers over their data? Uh, one is um, 
supporting that ag data is personal data and trying to get that going. Um, we need to address the data ownership problem, privacy and security problems. There, there are no regulations for how secure the data has to be once the companies take it, and they have already been data breaches. So that's already like an issue. We need to have some kind of minimum, some bar, <laughs> some standard to how well the data is being protected. Um, so establishing these federal regulations and then reframing how we approach the privacy policies so we don't have a situation where it's just turn the key, where we have something a little bit more robust that um, the farmers, it's communicated to the farmers in a way they can understand and that they have a choice and that they're able to, um, to negotiate that boundary with the companies. All right, so to just wrap up everything, um, I wanted to just kind of say that, you know, and there are a lot of different questions, a lot of research directions in agriculture. I feel like um, in, like computer science and human computer interaction, it's something that not a lot of people think about. Um, it's always been a field really important to me. Uh, my family, um, we're farm workers, that's what brought us to the United States. So I have like a personal connection and obligation to agriculture, but also like we all eat food. It's something that we all need. And so to have a hand in that and making sure that the, the food is being created um, ethically, that the workers are being treated fairly is really important to me. Um, and a lot of these questions in the field could really benefit from an interdisciplinary approach. And there's so many other um, questions that I didn't really get into in this presentation, but one is like, so the robotic arm with the strawberries, that's becoming more common now where you have autonomous, um, autonomous vehicles, autonomous robots in the field next to people out in the field. But does the engineer that designed the robot take into account this person? Does the robot understand the difference between a strawberry and a worker's hand? These types of things don't always get asked. And so that's why I think we really could benefit from an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the, the internet of things, there's a lot of sensors that are being deployed that you know, speak to each other and kind of control, can control things also autonomously out in the field. But you know, that really depends on internet. And if you look at um, rural broadband access, like that's not um, always the case that people are gonna have access to the high-speed internet that they're gonna need in order to use these technologies that could really benefit, um, benefit their work out in the field. So I really appreciate um, here at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm finishing up my first year here. Um, they just created the Center for Advanced Innovation in Agriculture. They're trying to bring this together, the idea that it is gonna take people of different expertise, um, people from different disciplines to address these questions. Um, and so I'm an affiliated faculty with them there. And I look forward to doing some more work with them. And hopefully this idea will spread and we'll see a lot more people from different disciplines working in agriculture. And that is the end of what I have for you all today. Thank you so much. This has been actually really interesting because I don't think I've ever thought about agriculture in this way. And I know we have a couple of questions in the chat. But I selfishly want to ask <laughs> to start off our question. Um, as someone who you know does a lot of like um, community-based participatory design, um, and it seems like you engaged with farm workers a lot. Was there any reluctance to um, accepting you know uh, even the, the the thought of big data being a part of um, what they do? Um, since this is kind of like a foreign way of, of thinking about, about agriculture. So is the question whether people were reluctant to adopt um, like some of the sensors that were, would collect all this information? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, or even just to think about their work in terms of like, the, of, of being data. So based on my work and some of the work of my coworkers um, in ALCE, there is that reluctance. There, there are those questions. Um, right now, cybersecurity out in the field with the sensors is a big question. And the thing is, is the farmers just don't have the expertise to kind of know where to start. Like they know it's a problem, 
they know that as much as um, having things automated is um, helping them with their workload, that it, it does expose them, it does make them vulnerable, but they don't, they kind of just like don't know where to start. And so that's where hopefully um, that we can come in and help them to address that in a way that makes sense for them, mm -hmm. that, that they can use. So one example, um, what we're working on, there is a farmer who a lot is very like into the smart farm thing. Everything's kind of connected and everything's off of this iPad, mm -hmm. but is that iPad secure? What happens if you accidentally press the wrong button? What happens if you get locked out? you then that's it like everything is tied to this ipad and if you get locked out if you press the wrong button then you can't do anything on the farm everything just yeah. um you can't fix that mm -hmm. so yeah so we need to be thinking about the human aspect as well like how are we making it um so that they can actually address these issues and not get end up in these situations where they get completely locked out of their technologies okay um, so let's jump to some of the questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat now, if you want to pick the questions or if you want to have them read out loud, let me know how. Uh, yeah, I can just start from the top or down. Okay. Um, so as these solutions that you build with farmers generalizable, or are they more mostly solutions best suited to that specific problem? How accurate are the classifiers that you're building? Are some more accurate than others? And what distinguishes a weed versus an ordinary plant? Okay, lots of questions. Um, so I guess the solutions, so like the agroability stuff is very specific to the farmer. We do um, do consultations. We talk to them about what their specific issues are and build something customizable for them. So that's not very generalizable. I guess if you have a lot of people, um, who are wheelchair bound and some of those technologies, some of those solutions can carry over, but we do take a very personalized approach to that. So it's a little slow going because we can't exactly just give them all um, the same thing and know that it's gonna work. Um, how accurate are the classifiers that you're building are some more accurate than others? Yes, so um, the classifiers are, um, let's see, when I actually built the one for the Marcin of Blash disease, I think it was about 80%. Uh, which, I mean, it goes a long way to, to addressing the issue, which was, you know, reducing the fungicide um, and mitigating the disease. Um, there are classifiers that are more accurate than others. Collecting that kind of information outdoors is very difficult. Even just the sun coverage, you know, if you have um, a cloudy day versus a sunny day and you're collecting the spectral image, uh, spectral data, that can make a huge difference, um, can throw off um, the classifier you have to kind of balance between it being robust and being as accurate as possible in order so that you can um, actually detect what it is that you're trying to detect and to um, target the application. And then what distinguishes a weed versus an ordinary plant? So isn't the thing like a weed, it's just a plant that's in the wrong place or something like that. Um, I guess it's just like it's for lambs quarters, people thought of it as a weed, they didn't know what it was, they didn't like it and they just pulled it out. But once we um, gave them more information about it, then it no longer became a weed to them. So I think that's just kind of a personal um, definition. I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's like a scientific definition for that. It's just a plant that most people in an area have decided that we don't want it. So it's a weed. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've heard that right to repair is a big issue with respect to farming. Have you found this concern surfacing in the things that you're studying? Yeah, absolutely. So that um, actually also did come up with um, our current study with um, the robotic, the exoskeleton. We did have farmers who asked about the right to repair that um, farmers in general are very hands-on, very um, DIY. And the question was, if we get this exoskeleton, are we gonna be able to modify it? Or is that gonna violate some kind of agreement that we're gonna have with the university or what our company ends up creating them. So that, that is a big issue. There is, I've seen kind of a, um, again, movement against it where people are learning themselves how to fix these things, regardless of what the user agreement says. And once they figure it out, then they share their knowledge with others. So there's this kind of grassroots um, movement happening where people are just like, you, 
we can't, um, the John Deere store, we don't have one nearby. We got to figure this out ourselves and we got to be self-sufficient because we can't wait. We can't, we can't have not have a tractor for weeks. We need to get this going. All right, how has, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Now, how has climate change affected your research, data collection, becoming absolutely fast in terms of adaptability of agricultural technologies in the near future? I mean, so that's a big question. These, I think the saying, another saying, <laughs> um, precision ag is like applying 21st technologies to um, 18th century practices. Um, and it's not, it's not the best um, approach that we have. And I think that the other um, methods that I talked about are gonna give us, take us a lot further, especially considering climate change. So growing food where people actually live. Um, in the cities, in these vertical farms. So then you're also reducing um, transportation. You're not having to um, use all those resources of getting the strawberries from California all the way to Virginia. Um, it kind of surprises me how some of the vegetables and stuff I buy at the store here are actually from like my hometown in California. <laughs> it's like, why do they have to fly it all the way over here? Uh, so they're, um, the precision ag, yeah, it's going to be very affected by climate change. And so that's why a lot of us are um, switching over to these other newer technologies that are going to better address the problem. All right, so this question is about the ground truth data land supporters. How many participants contribute to the focus groups? Was their impact on demographics? How is the data quality guarantee, particularly when the crowdsourcing platform deals with an edible plant? And what was the most important motivational aspect? for participants in, in the DMV. All right, so <laughs> how many participants contributed? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I wanna say about in the 20s. I mean, it was a smaller study. Uh, was there impact on demographics? I'm not sure what that question is asking. The participants were recruited through the Lister from the University of DC, which meant that they had, some, they had contact with the university. And as a land grant, they did a lot of community outreach. So, I mean, there were people from the, from the area, but it was a little bit biased in that they had already either, you know, gone to a, um, gone to a class, um, were in the master gardener program, got, um, gone to the farmer's market. So there was, I guess, a slight bias there in that they already had sort of an invested interest in ag. The data, how is the data quality guaranteed? Yeah, that's a big question for crowdsourcing with edible plants. Um, the, I guess the lucky thing about lambs quarters is that all of its lookalikes were not poisonous. So thankfully, even if somebody ate one on accident, they weren't gonna get sick. But the main way that we verified quality was by having that, um, the expert at the university verify the classification. And once it was verified, that's when it would get pushed out to the, to the map so that people weren't working off inaccurate information. And the motivational aspect for participants in the DMV. So when, we, when I was asking them about that, like how could we um, convince you to participate, to, to download the app and go around and collect this information. A lot of people talked about, you know, the sense of community, about having the social aspect of it. So having events, um, where we would all meet at a certain time together at the certain park and we would all go around together looking for the plants and as a way to meet other like-minded individuals who had an interest in community gardening, who had an interest in cooking. Um, that, that was a really big motivation for the participants. All right, Ooh, lots of questions. <laughs> Let's see, um, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned food supply issue in the future. I've always heard that food production and supply outpaces demand, at least in the US. Um, however, I'm assuming this isn't the case in other parts of the world that currently face food shortages. When increase in ag technology here alleviate food supply issues in places that might not have access to all this technology in the first place. Yeah, so that that is kind of what, um, what I'm looking at in terms of like usability of these technologies, a big part of it is like affordability, right? Some of these um, technologies have a huge upfront cost, but there's a lot of um, commercial off the shelf components that we can use to, um, to still build the same technologies in a more affordable way. 
um, there there is a lot of food waste in the United States. That is also another part of the part of the equation. There are there's there are high standards to the, the fruits and vegetables that go to the major grocery stores, which result in a lot of um, less desirable fruits and vegetables just being in the field and rotting, even though there's something wrong with it. There, I'm sorry. <coughs> there are a lot of different factors that go into this. And this was just a tiny little slice of how we could potentially address these issues. Um, but yeah, it's, we do, if we were to actually take all that food and distribute it to everybody right now, we could feed everybody. Right now, we do generate enough food to feed everybody. It's just a matter of, yeah, one place has too much and one place has too little. Uh, but the way the, the population models were working had us not in that situation by 2050. But you know, this was all before COVID and everything, and who knows how that has an impact on the models now. Okay. I think that that's the last question in the chat. Does anyone else have any questions verbally? Um, I think that this has been a really interesting conversation um, in an area completely new to me. So I definitely learned something today. So thank you for that. Um, any last minute questions? All right, so we'll, we're pulling right up on 2 p.m. Central. Um, thank you so much, Brianna, for your an amazing and very informative talk. Um, and I really appreciate um, you taking the time today to join us. Um, as a reminder, um, this recording will be up on D2L for the students to view um, after today. Um, and it'll also be uh, located on the CDM Research Colloquium's uh, YouTube channel. Um, I'm not sure when, but at some point during the quarter, um, these will be uploaded there. Um, so.